good to have you here or online, wherever you're joining us. We are excited to worship God together with one voice from near and far. I feel like I should be starting a Dr. Seuss rhyme or something right now. Um, if you need lyrics, we have them being passed out by the lovely Carol, if you didn't print them on your phone already. Um, but man, let's enter into worship and uh, let's sing songs unto our God and Savior. Lord God, I pray this morning that you would remind us how big you are, that you would remind us that you are the God who can do anything, Lord. There is nothing that is impossible for you. And yet so often, Lord, we just live our lives like there's so many things that are impossible or so many things that can't be done. But, Lord, you are the God who said that we could pray and ask a mountain to move and it would move in your name. And so I pray that you would give us confidence in that faith this morning as we lift up your name, as we turn to you, Lord. May we lay every burden at our feet, every impossible at your feet. And may we ask that you would come and be bigger than everything we could imagine. In your name we pray. Amen.
talking about a, a wonderful story that we all love, even as kids. We're talking about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and a bumblebee. Any kids? VeggieTales? No? Okay. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The VeggieTales version is great. Um, but I was thinking of this idea that kind of, for a lot of us, most of us haven't really experienced a time where we, like, were afraid because of our faith. Maybe we were kind of, like, embarrassed or um, kind of had something happen that we're like, oh, I'm going to look weird if I talk about who Jesus is. Um, but a lot of us haven't exactly faced this, like, life or death situation. But kind of looking at the way that our world is going, I mean, this is the first year that our churches have been shut down. And there's been regulations put on us like, hey, you can't sing or you can't do these different things. And we kind of need to start resolving in our mind what our answer is going to be if we do get put in this situation of, like, bow down and worship this other thing or, you know, don't do this, don't worship the Lord. What is our answer going to be? Um, and I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I was thinking of this story, and, and their answer, you know, is, is uh, our God can save us. Our God can rescue us from this fire. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down and worship your God. And I was thinking, man, if I'm in that situation, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that my response is going to be like, I'll go to death and I, before I deny the Lord. But I'm thinking, would I really think, like, God can rescue me from that fire? Like, if, if, if there's a fire before me, they're going to throw me in. I really believe, I fully believe that God could be there with me in the midst of the fire. I don't know that I really have that kind of faith right now. And that's the kind of faith I want that says, like, yes, I, I will go to the death for you, Lord. But I also know that you can rescue. You are the God who can do anything, anything even defy death as he does in this story and I just want to encourage us this morning that if you're maybe a little bit like me where you're like yeah I might go to death for God but gosh could God really like rescue me from like a certain death in a fire um, that we would pray and we would ask the Lord to open up our eyes to how big he truly is that he really is a way maker a miracle worker a light in the darkness that as we sing these words it would come alive in our hearts that we would have a bigger view of who God is that we would understand more of who he is this morning amen
you are a miracle worker there is nothing that you cannot do I pray that you would embolden us this morning Lord to be your people in this time Lord in a time where man it's just getting harder to be a church Lord would you give us boldness not because of some false confidence but because we are backed by a God and we are serving a God who is a miracle worker a God who is the God of the impossible God, fill us with your spirit. We know that you have filled us with your spirit as believers, but God, would you help us to rely on your spirit, God? Help us to knock down all those places of fear that hold us back from being who we truly are meant to be, and would you embolden us to be the people you've called us to be, Lord, heaven's armies. God, give us faith like like these characters and these people, not, not even characters, like these people that we're studying this morning, Lord, give us that kind of faith that says, my God can do anything, but even if he doesn't, I will serve him wholeheartedly. We want to serve you wholeheartedly this morning, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks amen for worshiping with us. Catherine's coming up for our children's story. <laughs> I was like trying to think of a really cool word and story. I couldn't. Good morning, friends. Um, so if you are a kid, so you go to our Sunday school or you're visiting and you're in preschool or elementary school, I'd love to be able to see your face and your eyes up here because this story is super cool. It's one of my favorites. And like Brittany said, there's a Veggie Tale um, version of this called Rack, Shack, and Benny. And I highly recommend you go and look it up. This is peak 90s kid stuff, but it's so good. Look it up. Um, and so, who remembers our Bible story from last week? You guys, if you're a kid, you can shout it out. Our Bible story from last week. Yes, sir. David and Goliath. Nice work, bud. David and Goliath, they were in their promised land. And they were fighting some people. It was a big deal. So, this story takes place a long time after that. And God's people were captured by people. Um, Let me start over in my sentence. So picture the promised land in your mind, you guys. And God's people were captured and taken away from this promised land and taken to a place called Babylon. Boys and girls, can you guys say Babylon really loud? Okay, nice. I know we're warming up. Good work. And in that country, the king's name was Nebuchadnezzar. Can you say that with me? Nebuchadnezzar. Um, And it's cool that people have names that sound different from maybe a name that your family has. But it's good to practice pronouncing people's names. Um, And there were three young men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is where we get Rack, Shack, and Benny. That was the nickname in the Veggie Tales. But in the Bible, their names were, can you say it with me? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they worked for King Nebuchadnezzar. But when the king wanted them to bow down and worship a false idol, which is a fake version of our God that we worship, they wouldn't do it. And so the king told his soldiers to put all three men into a red hot furnace. What goes in a furnace, boys and girls? Can you think? What goes in a furnace? Fire. They put them in like a giant fire pit, but even super, super, super hotter than that. And what do you think happened next? What happened after that? Sophia? They threw them into the furnace. Did they turn into like a burnt marshmallow? No. What happened? What do you think? They weren't touched. The men in the furnace did not burn up. God sent someone to protect them in the furnace. And the king went down to check to see what was happening. 
and he saw four people walking around in the middle of all this fire. And who remembers how many people went into that furnace? Lennon? Three went in. God used his power to perform a miracle to save his faithful sons, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king was shocked. Can you show me shocked faces? Shocked is surprised. And, oh, I can't believe that happened. And after that, he told those men to get out of the fire, and he made a new law. His heart was changed because he saw a miracle of God. He saw the power of God, and he made a new law. It said that no one could say anything bad about the God of these men. So that was this new rule because he saw that God is a God to be honored and respected and believed in, which is the same God that we worship today, the same God who loves you, the same God who wants good things for you, and the same God that will be with you when hard things come. And God has promised to be with us no matter what happens. And that goes back to our memory verse from VBS. So we're going to keep going over these memory verses because we want to keep these in our hearts. And the way we do that is by saying it over and over and over. Who can say or wants to give it a try to our memory verse, our Joshua 1.9 from a few weeks ago? Riley? Okay. Really loud. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Riley. That takes a lot of courage to do. So for those of you at home, um, Riley said our verse, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And so with us, friends, as we start to go to the grown-up story, I want you to remember that God is with us wherever we go. And I, to wrap up, was thinking a lot about bubbles this morning, which I get bet you could guess why. And bubbles are just soap and water, but they turn into something really beautiful and magical and fun. And I think that's something that we can take with us into this week, that in doing our everyday lives, I know some of us are getting ready for school to start. Some of us might have a lot of feelings about school starting. And in acknowledging all of that, that the Lord is with us in our everyday moments where something like soap and water can turn into something really profound and significant. So I would invite us as a people, and I'm speaking to myself as well, to keep in mind that the ordinary things can truly be miraculous and profound as we go through this week. So I am going to close. And so with that, I have some news of a big change that is a good change, but it affects a lot of you guys in some way. Um, I was just hired to teach full-time science and history, which I am super excited about. But with that, I am not going to be able to do multiple jobs. And so next Sunday is going to be my last Sunday as kids director. Um, and this has been a process of prayer and faith and a lot of hard work and interviewing and um, I really believe that the place where I'm at is a place that God has um, given me. It's kind of a miracle that I got a job as a first-year teacher anyway, um, but it just seems like this is what months and years of prayer and finding myself and finding what I feel like God's calling on my life is. Um, so with that, I want to thank each and every one of you, whether you're at home, whether you're even if you're not watching it this morning and you find out from a friend. <laughs> um, I am so thankful for the last two and a half years here. I love each and every one of you guys, and I'm not moving, so I'm still going to be here. But I just wanted to be up front, and I know that you can text me, call me, meet with me, whatever. But I'm so happy and excited for this new change coming up. You know what? Father God, we thank you so much for Catherine. We thank you so much for her vision and her passion and just how you've used her here with the team to bring about great things for your kingdom and for the kids here. And we thank you that you've called her on to a new adventure. 
that you're going to use your gifts and skills and in a new way for for uh, the kingdom of God. And we just we fully support her and pray for her and ask that you would just meet her in every challenge and make your presence very tangible to her. We love her and we thank you so much for her in Jesus' name. Amen. And real quick, I would be remiss if I didn't say that all the stuff that has happened over the last two and a half years since I've started as director is by the grace of God, by your guys' support and your prayer and your volunteering and buying random things and loving us and giving us words of encouragement. But Marissa Ortega and Kelsey Phelps, who's not here this morning, really have made this a wonderful place. So can we give a round of applause for Marissa, who is here, and then Kelsey is not. So my mic broke on the way up this morning, so I got the handheld. So it'll be a challenge. Tough news, but uh, God is in the midst of that for her and for us. And uh, let's continue to pray and trust him. How are you guys doing today? Ambivalent. A lot going on in our our nation, our world, our our county. And... uh, I don't like to comment on stuff on Sunday morning because invariably, you know, I get hailed for being bold or whatever, but it it polarizes, and we've been seeking very, very much to keep God the focus of all that we do, and that's not to say that others aren't by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I think that if I was to say anything today, I just want to call us to grace. We need an abundance of grace right now. Um... You know, I I see posts, I see stuff that people say constantly, and people use the same scriptures, and they interpret them differently, and they come down in different lines to say whether right now what we're facing is persecution or whether it's not, and um, on and on and on. And I see churches and pastors that say one thing and then do an about face using the same scriptures again, so... All of that to say that we need, we need grace right now. And uh, I, I personally do not believe that this is persecution. We are not being told that we cannot worship God. And we have said so many times that the church is more than a physical building. And do we really believe that? You know, we're challenged right now to social distance and to wear masks. But I think that's altogether different than being told whether or not we can worship God, whether or not we can pray, whether or not we can sing. So there's challenges, and we have to creatively go around those, and we need to pray for our our brothers and sisters that are experiencing persecution right now and going through tough times, and I hope that you'll join me in that. And let's stay unified in everything we do because throughout these challenges, Satan's goal and desire is to divide us and to cause disunity, and he, he loves that. And so let's keep... God in focus through all this. As, as Catherine said today, we're, we're talking about a, an awesome, beloved story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as Brittany so beautifully illustrated and conveyed a few weeks ago in her worship piece. You know, uh, these guys were branded. They were renamed with Babylonian names, so much so that it has stuck even to today. Even today, many of us are challenged to remember what their Hebrew names were, you know, uh, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, you know, and, uh, and yet these guys took a stand, and there were things they were willing to do and things they weren't willing to do, and I want to begin today by asking you a question, and it's a simple question that I'd like for you to reflect upon throughout today's message, but I want you to think about your heroes of the faith from the Bible. Who are the people that jump out of Scripture to you as your heroes of the faith? And along with that question, I want to ask you this parallel question, and that is, how many of those people that you're thinking of had easy lives? How many of the heroes that you're thinking of in Scripture had easy lives? As you read that uh, beautiful chapter in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11, that has the hall of faith, as they call it, these great men and women of faith who who were ordinary people like you and I, but they trusted God and God did amazing things through them. You know, you go through that list and not many of them, if any of them, had easy lives at all. 
but God worked through them. And I want you to reflect on that this morning as we go through our text. We're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 3 today. We're going to look at verses 1 to 30, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is what's recorded for us. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officials, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races, nations, and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. Snitched on them is better. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring that all people bow and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, and everything else. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they brought in, when they brought them in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made. And when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, but if you refuse, you will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. And then, what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Other translations say we do not need to respond or give an answer. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. And then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army. These were really his top soldiers, kind of the same as David's mighty men that we read about in 2 Samuel 23. He, he ordered these mighty men to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames even killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look! Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came close, as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace, and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire, and then the high officials the governors, the advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to re rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve 
or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. For there is no other God who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Quite an amazing story of God's deliverance and of an about face in terms of decrees and uh, statutes that the king makes and orders. Back in chapter 2 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. And it was a dream that tormented him and kept him up and made him worried. And it was really a dream, kind of a symbolic, cryptic dream of how God wanted to use him in the world at that time. And in this dream, he was identified as a gold head. His position, his uh, title was really represented by this symbol made of gold, uh, and particularly the head. And his takeaway from this, as we see in our passage today, was to erect a gold statue for people of all kingdoms to worship. His goal was to establish a unified government and a unified religion. And so he made himself both the head of state and the head of all religion. And all who served under him had to recognize both his political as well as his religious authority. And since Babylon had seceded Assyria as the new world empire, this was easy for him to do. It was easy for him to assemble all the leaders of all uh, those in his domain and to demand from them this oath of loyalty. And as we read, the image was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And architects, historians, everyone will tell you that an image of that height can't stand up without toppling over with those dimensions. And so most believe that it had a, a big base to support it. In fact, many believe the base was more like a pedestal, and maybe the image itself wasn't 90 feet tall, but in its totality, it was that tall. And it's interesting to note that archaeologists have uncovered a large square made of bricks some six miles southeast east of Babylon. And many believe that this is, in fact, the base upon which this statue stood and was secured in this, in this plain. All of the different leaders that we read about in our text, the satraps were the chief representatives to the king. The prefects were the military commanders. The governors were the civil administrators. The advisors were counselors to those in governmental authority. The treasurers, as we know, administered the funds of the kingdom. The judges administered the law. The magistrates passed the judgment in keeping with the law. And probably the provincial officials were subordinates of the satraps. And all of these different leaders were mandated to come for this coronation, this dedication of this, this statue. And yet some Chaldeans snitched on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of this, this school of astronomers, astrologers, if you will, and uh, very smart people. And if you've ever watched the documentary, The Star of Bethlehem, Rick Larson, the guy who, who does the research in this, believes, and I tend to believe with him, that this is the start of the wise men who will one day come to visit the Christ child. That Daniel and these three guys had such an influence in Babylonia that that is particularly why they know 500 years later all of the prophecy about the Christ child. And it is this group of people that come to be known as wise men and come to seek out Christ at his birth. Well, as always, there are at least three things that we can learn in this text, and I'm not going to disappoint today. There's three things that jump out at me that I'd like to share with you. And, and really the essence or the substance of what I see is, is found in verses 15 to 18. And the first is that question that Nebuchadnezzar asks in verse 15. He says, what God can deliver? What God can deliver? You know, the, the thinking of the Babylonians were, you're our slaves. You're in exile. So whatever God you worship cannot be that powerful. Because if he was, you wouldn't be here. And if you think about that logic, it kind of makes sense. 
you know, what God would allow his people to be deported from their homeland to a foreign nation, nation and be slaves to them. And they had no comprehension that God had deliberately, intentionally done that because he was, he was disciplining his people. He was teaching them a lesson. That didn't enter their minds. To them, all that equated to is your God is powerless. Your God must be dead or lifeless or impotent that he can't save you. But Nebuchadnezzar made this huge mistake of pitting himself against God. Notice he doesn't say, you know, you cannot be rescued from my hand. But he says, what God is there who will be able to rescue you from me? He makes a big mistake there. He converted his confrontation with people into a contest with God. And he was sure to lose that. God was certainly not going to stand up to that. What God can deliver. And as we know, the truth is only one God. Only one God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. That is the God of the Bible. The one true living God that we serve that's able to deliver. And, you know, many of us here today, we understand that. We get that. We get who God is. We get how powerful he is. We get what he's capable of. But the challenge has always been for us, how do we encounter this God? How do we encounter this God? How do we experience him personally? How do we come to not only know him, but to trust him in the everyday things of our life. That's the challenge. And, and I want to say there's, there's, a, there's a danger for us as modern-day Christ followers living in this comfortable world of convenience and options. And the danger is that our primary goal becomes, if you will, furnace avoidance. Furnace avoidance. We avoid the furnace at all costs. Our prayers start to sound like, God, deliver me from pain. Deliver me from discomfort, from suffering, from inconvenience. Make my life smooth. Make my life easy. Make my life comfortable. Make it pleasant. Remove all of the obstacles. I confess, many times my prayers sound like that. I think that that's really the, the path to my happiness and my, my joy. And the truth is this, that sometimes God delivers us from the furnace, but sometimes God delivers us in the furnace, not from the furnace, but in the midst of the furnace. And those end up being some of the greatest moments of our life. And we can miss them if we're not looking for them and if we're not willing to go to that place. Sometimes, you know, we want to get transferred from a job that we perceive as bad. And we want to find a job with nicer people and a nicer situation. And, and, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe God's plan is also to have us right where we are and to use us in the midst of that. Maybe he wants to grow up have us grow up in our judgment and our discernment and our ability to know when to speak and when to be quiet. Maybe he wants to grow us in our ability to love people when it's easier to resent them and to judge them and to write them off. And maybe we need to stop praying for deliverance from the furnace and ask for the presence of the God who meets people there. Maybe there's a Nebuchadnezzar that God wants to reach through through me and through you. And God's calling for you to meet him in the furnace. I know that's not a popular thought, but maybe that's the truth. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came to the plain of Dura, planning to withhold worship from an idol, from a false god. And they ended up worshiping like they had never worshiped before in all of their lives. The furnace that looked to spell out the end for them, it looked like certain death, turned out to be the greatest adventure that they had ever experienced. Because the furnace turned out to be the place where they met God. And God will meet us in the furnace too. What God can deliver? Only one. The God of the Bible, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
The second thing that I see in our passage is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response in verse 16. They say, no answer is needed. We're not going to give you an answer. And the point here is that you already know by who we are and how we've lived our lives. You know you're not going to force us to a false decision. We have already demonstrated by our faith and our convictions what kind of people we are. You're not going to force our hand. Their words, the God that we serve, in verse 16 and verse 20, showed that they recognized God as a greater authority than the authority of Nebuchadnezzar. And they teach us about living a life that doesn't require explanation. I'm challenged by that. Do I live a life that doesn't require explanation? Do you live a life that doesn't require explanation? Rather than talking up a storm about what we believe and then living in such a way that we continually call those beliefs into question, we are called to live a life that reinforces everything we believe and what's important to us. I love that that famous quote by St. Francis of Assisi where he says, go everywhere preaching the gospel, and if necessary, use words. You know, hopefully the gospel message can be conveyed not just through words, but through actions, through demonstrations of love. And you know, the honest truth is that for each of us, inevitably there comes a moment when we realize that death is inescapable and there's nothing we can do about it. And often you hear a person's last words, their last message is an expression of regret at having to leave this earthly life. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Death was escapable. It was escapable. All they had to do was bend a knee to worship the golden image. All their nightmare would be over if they would do this. They would live to be restored to positions of power and honor and status. They were headed toward unimaginable pain and death. And one word would have meant life for them. But they would not say that word. They would not bend that knee. And, you know, we today can either look at the story and look at them as superhuman saints, or as I would like to argue, we can see them as ordinary people, that God is able to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things because it's not about us and it never was about us, but it's about the God that we serve. Do you believe that? Amen. Thank you. I was listening to Andy Stanley recently, and I love this quote. He says, God is not out looking for influential people he can make faithful. Let me repeat that. God is not out looking for influential people that he can make faithful. God is looking for faithful men and women, boys and girls, whom he can elevate to positions of influence. Do you see the difference there? We're often tempted to think that God is looking for athletes and rock stars and TV stars and wealthy people to make into Christians so we can have influential people of faith, as if God's limited. But this passage teaches us the exact opposite of that. If you think about it, there were a lot of guys that marched out of Israel into Babylon, and we don't know any of their names. And maybe, quite possibly, we don't know their names because they compromised, because they weren't willing to stand up for their faith, because they didn't stand by their convictions. Historians and archaeologists tell us that there were probably about 80,000 people who lived in Judah at the time, 80,000 male adults, because the men were the ones that were taken, who lived in Judah at the time that Babylon sacked Judah. And they took about 25% of the population away. So we're looking at about probably 20,000 men who went to Babylonia. And they took the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest. But I want you to just consider this. Out of 20,000 guys, we know today the names of four. Only four. Because these guys stuck to their guns. And they stood up for their faith and they said, no answer is needed. No answer is needed. The third and the final thing that I want to say to you today is I love their words in verse 18 when they say, even if, even if. 
Back in chapter 1, Daniel was forced to make a decision. He was offered the king's wine and food, but he knew that 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 food and that drink had been offered to idols. And for him, this was an issue of conviction. He was forced to decide whether to, to compromise what he ate and drank or to stand by his conviction. And he chose the latter. In verse 8, it says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food and with the wine which he drank. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Friends, convictions are something that have to be forged before we're in the midst of a crisis, before we're going through a trial. You don't wait until you're going through a trial or a testing to determine what's important to you. You need to know that ahead of time. And I believe there's a very important point for us here today in this passage, and and, and it's this. You and I will never take even if stands, regardless of the consequences, until we settle our convictions. You, You and I will never come to that point of faith that says, even if, God, even if. Until we settle our, convic- our convictions. And my question for you today is, have you made up your mind spiritually, ethically, morally? Have you made up your mind what is important to you, what you're willing to die for, and what's inconsequential, what's not important, what's not the main issue? Each person has to do that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decided, even if God doesn't act like we expect him to or hope he will, our faith isn't conditional. That's what they demonstrated. Our faith isn't conditional, and it can't be manipulated. I was reading this week that in the spring of 1940, in the midst of World War II, the German army was plowing through France despite the help from more than 300,000 British troops. America wasn't in this particular war or this battle. Finally, the Germans surrounded and trapped most of the Allied forces at Dunkirk, a town in northern France, and it appeared that the Allied army would face annihilation or surrender. Eventually, through a miraculous outpouring of courage, the British managed to organize hundreds of little ships that evacuated most of the Allied forces. But before the evacuation, at one point when everything looked utterly hopeless, Allegedly, a British officer sent the following message, condensed into three powerful words. But if not. But if not. At the time, it was a strong message of courage and of ultimate hope in the midst of trouble. The message conveyed that the British would stand defiantly against the Nazis and that God would provide a way through the dark night. This three-word message, but if not, came straight from our passage today in the King James Bible. It was inspired by the very story that we're reading and teaching about today. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced the fiery furnace, they refused to go down in defeat. They declared their trust in God no matter the outcome. And I I just want to say a few things in closing today, a few points of application. First of all, I want to highlight the fact that there's a lot of prophetic significance and relevance to our story today. Think about the fact that in the coming tribulation, the great tribulation of seven years that we read about in Revelation and throughout Scripture, in the coming tribulation, a Gentile ruler will demand for himself the worship that belongs only to God. And any who refuse to acknowledge his right to receive worship will be killed. Assuming political and religious power, he will oppress Israel. And most of the world, most of the people in the world, including many in Israel, will submit and worship him. But there will be a small remnant, like the three in Daniel's day, who refuse. Incidentally, most scholars and theologians believe that either Daniel was in a position of authority where he wasn't forced to bow down or he was away on business because he would have actually he would have absolutely stood side by side with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He would have never been to the knee either. And it's kind of alarming that he's not mentioned in the story, but the story's not about him. You know, as I was studying this passage this week, I, I wondered what the rest of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's lives look like. 
And what, what happened from this point? How did their lives change? How did this mark them? We don't know because it's the last time that they're ever mentioned again in Scripture other than referring back to them in the New Testament. I wonder if they ever thought about how easily they could have missed this adventure had they caved, had they not stood by their convictions. If they had given in to fear, one word, one bent knee, they would have missed the greatest encounter with Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, that fourth figure in the midst of the fire. And it's this point that I want to impress upon you this morning. That this, is, this is my takeaway. If you ever spend time in the furnace, if you ever trust God enough to go to the place that looks like it's the end, and you meet God there, it will mark you for the rest of your life. It will change you completely. You will never be the same again. You will carry that memory and that experience to the grave. And I know saints, both living and and who have gone before us, who would testify to that with all of their heart and soul and mind and strength. Going into the furnace, which looked like the last thing that they wanted to do, ended up being the greatest event of their lives. And ironically, the furnace, which looked like it was spelled out death, ended up being the safest place of all. And we, and we say, how? How is that possible? Because God was there. Because God was in the midst of that. I, you know, we've talked about this so many times in so many other sermons, but most of us want more than anything else in our life to experience God, to encounter him, to feel his presence. And yet we're constantly drawing the boundaries. God, would, would you please just carve out this bubble for me Make it safe, make it comfortable, make it convenient, protect me. And God is working mightily in the world, but he is outside of that bubble. He is outside of those boundary lines that we're drawing. And we can either, you know, have him grant our prayers and live a very mediocre, complacent life, or we can say, God, I trust you. Take me wherever you want to take me. Use me however you want to use me. I just want to see you. I just want to feel you. I want to, I want to sense your presence with me every moment. And, and friends, that message this week rocked me to my core. I want to spend the next 50 years, if God allows me another 50 years, living on the edge and experiencing God firsthand, not reading about him, not hearing stories about him from other people or from other places in the world. I want to live it. I want to experience it. And I believe that it involves taking a stand and it it involves believing in God who doesn't always deliver us out of things, but sometimes in the midst of things. You know, I titled today's sermon, Taking a Stand. But if I were to rename today's sermon, I'd call it Meet Me in the Furnace. Meet Me in the Furnace. I think we need to understand that you and I are gathered here today because throughout history, Hundreds of thousands of ordinary men and women, just like us, most of who are long since forgotten, said that they were willing to go to the furnace. They loved God that much. And God did not forget them. God did not forsake them. God said to them what he said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What he said to Stephen, the first Christ follower who was martyred for his faith. What he said to Paul and Peter when they were persecuted and beaten and jailed and then martyred as well. What he said to Corey Ten Boom, what he said to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, what he said to Mother Teresa on the streets of Calcutta, what he says to his saints today in in China going through persecution and in Albania, and even what he says to his people today in Ventura, California. And his message is simple. I'll meet you in the furnace if you dare. I'll meet you in the midst of it. And I just want to close with that. Friends, this is our day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had their day. Daniel had his day. Stephen had his day. Peter and Paul had their day. Corey Ten Boom, her day. So on. This is our day. Our final moment is going to come. And I don't know 
what furnace it is that you're facing today. And I don't know what it means for you specifically. But I do know who will meet you there. I know the God who will meet you there in the midst of that. And I believe that God will say to you, as he will say to me, in the words of Isaiah 43, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. I want to close today by calling the band back up and leaving my water bottle up there. And I want, to, I want to draw us to a place of commitment today because I know that if this message today touched you the way that it got me this week, for some of us it means we need to make a decision. We need to make a decision from sitting on the sidelines and playing it safe, from being complacent, from being apathetic to really fully surrendering to God and not continually drawing lines of boundaries. God, I'll, I'll go as long as it's here. I'll do this as long as it involves this. But saying, God, have your way. I've served you long enough. I've known you long enough. Whatever you ask, I'm willing. And I really believe that the rest of your life will be decidedly, powerfully different than it's been. Not only mine, but yours as well. And some of you today maybe don't know the Lord personally. You've never invited him into your life and made him Savior and Lord. You've never confessed and acknowledged that what he did on the cross through his son, Jesus Christ, paid for your sins once and for all. And that the only way to eternal life is through him and through that relationship which he offers to us through grace. And many of you know that. And you made that decision a long time ago, but you're, 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 not, you're not engaged the way he wants you to be engaged. You're not given to him the way that he wants you to be given to him and surrendered. And so I'm just calling you. There's going to be leaders coming forward. I'll be up here, and we're just here to pray with you. There's no hocus pocus. There's no anointing with oil. There's no weird stuff. But we're just here to pray with you and to honor that commitment and that decision that you want to make and how God is stirring in your heart. And, yeah, there's a level of coming before other people, but, you know, that's part of what God said. If we're willing to confess him before people, he's willing to confess us one day before the Heavenly Father. And so I'm going to invite the, the team to sing and lead us in this last song, which is so exactly perfect for today. We've sang it before, and it's just powerful. And if you're ready, come. And if you're not ready during the song, come after the service. We'll still be here, but I invite you. Father God, would you use your words to continue to convict us and encourage us? May we not be those who hear and turn away and do nothing about it but may your words provoke us and stir us and stimulate us to action. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you that we are not powerless, Lord. The same power that raised you from the grave is alive in us. The same power that raised you from the grave is with us through the fire, through the furnace, through come what may, whatever may come in our life, Lord. You are there with us in the fire. Lord, would you help us to not be so comfortable that we're just afraid of the fire, but we would be people who are able to say, my God can rescue me, but even if I'm there in the fire, I know that he will be with me. I know that I'm standing with him, Lord. Would you help us to boldly follow you, Lord? In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for worshiping with us. We love having you here. Um, If you're at home, we love having you with us as well. And we hope you have a great week. We'll see you here next week.